begin. Uh, welcome to the December 12th, 2022 meeting of East Bay Community Energy's Community Advisory Committee. Uh, can you please take roll call and confirm quorum? Great, thank you very much. Uh, Cynthia Landry. Cynthia Landry. I'll come back to Cynthia Landry. Lisa Hugh. Here. Member Liu. Yes. Member Swami Nathan. Here. Member Lakshman. I'm here. Member Taria. Here. Member Pacheco. Present. Member Susan. I thought I told you the memory. Member Susan. Member Hernandez. Present. Member Lutz. I'm here. Is member, uh, member Carr? And Chair Eldred. Muted, but present. Great, thank you. We have a quorum. And I'm here, uh, Adrian, also. I'm sorry. Great, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the first agenda item is uh, that of public comment. I do want to remind the public that this item is reserved for persons wishing to speak on agenda items or on items that are not on this evening's agenda. If you are making comments on an uh, item on tonight's agenda, please hold it for that item. Public comment is uh, available for each item. Um, have we received any communications prior to 5 p.m. yesterday, or are there any members of the public with their hands raised? Uh, yes, we have two members of the public with their hand raised, uh, Brendan Pittman and Melissa Yu. Uh, Brendan Pittman, I'll recognize you for three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Brendan Pittman. I'm a resident of Berkeley. Um, and I'm here on my own accord. Um, thank you for taking my comment. Um, just a few questions on the topic of the carbon-free allocation. At the uh, November 17th, 2021 Board of Directors meeting, uh, Jim Durant provided an update on the carbon-free allocation approved by the Board of Directors in December 2020. He summarized that uh, EBCE customers are entitled to load proportional share of generation from PG&E contracted carbon-free resources, which are from two different pools. Those included the large hydro and nuclear resources contracted by PG&E. In December 2020, the Board of Directors approved accepting both large hydro generation um, and the nuclear, or sorry, um, they approved the uh, hydro, but they uh, approved nuclear to um, be resold um, with the understanding that the uh, full amount of nuclear generation um, would be sold to a different party and uh, they would then sell it again with 50% of the net profits going to EBCE. Um, Jim mentioned at that November meeting that the party EBC worked with had continued to make attempts to sell that nuclear generation by doing outreach in California, the WEC and the Northeast. However, to quote him, uh, they just haven't been able to move any of these volumes, sadly to say, and that's the reality, reality of it. So a few questions that I'm hoping uh, that staff can maybe provide some additional information or follow up on. Um, first, uh, I was curious if uh, who that contractor uh, party was who was trying to move that nuclear generation volume, um, if that's uh, is a public knowledge, can that be revealed? Um, and just for transparency. Um, and then could staff also provide the board of directors um, or me, <laughs> specific reasons why that generation could not be sold. Um, I mean, I may, I may be naive, but my understanding is that this allocation was bought from PG&E at $0 and sold at, to that third party at $0. I would think energy sold near $0 would have some level value. Again, I'm not in the mix of how the market works and all the buying and trading, um, but hopefully I can get some answers on that. Um, on a separate topic, uh, there are two rate cases EBC customers have access to, as you know, Bright Choice and Renewable 100. Uh, this may be a tough question, but had the board approved nuclear allocation and folded it into the Bright Choice rate case, would ratepayers have saved additional money? And if so, how much? 
And finally, last topic, I know I have 15 seconds left. Um, I'd like to call attention that the California legislature has created the conditions for Diablo Canyon to remain open until 2030 through the passage of SB 846 during the fall 2022 session. Um, this is five additional years of clean, reliable, and cheap electricity accessible to ratepayers and likely more. Um, I strongly encourage EBC to reconsider taking those credits in the future and take responsible steps to educate customers. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary to cut somebody off it, it, while they're speaking. If you want to just, I mean, it sounded like you're real close to the end of your sentence there, Brendan, if you want to finish it, then go for it. Sorry about that. Yep. And and I have one last sentence. I'm just going to say that nuclear power, I know this is a lot of comments you received from the public on this that say it's not clean, but nuclear power has the second lowest life cycle emissions of all energy sources, according to the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. I look forward to attending future meetings and working with you guys on this topic. Thank you again for extending the time and thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And we had, uh, so Melissa, you, you are up next. Um, if the clerk can reset the timer for three minutes. Thank you, go for it, Melissa. Hi, good evening community members. Melissa Yu here with the Sierra Club. Um, with the year, year coming to an end, I'm here today to thank the CAC for all of the work that you all have done this year. The hard work that you've got that you've done does not go unrecognized, and especially the agency's efforts to relieve utility debt um, during and after the pandemic or whatever phase of the pandemic we're in. Um, in addition to this, I also wanted to echo some of the concerns that were raised by the East Bay Clean Power Alliance in a letter that was submitted into record this morning about how community engagement has been in some ways inhibited um, in ways that affect community members from being able to constructively engage th this year. Um, the public records request solicitation uh, brought to life brought to light some missteps in email communications between EBC board members and staff. And we just want to urge the CAC to take action to ensure that these actions don't continue and that we start the new year with a clean slate and with full transparency. And we are all working towards a common goal to create a CCA that actualizes a program to accelerate the development of clean energy assets within our county, within Alameda County, and through um, through local power development. Um, I also want to thank Adrian for all the work that you've been doing and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak and thank you everyone for everything you do. Thank you, Melissa. Um, next up is um, Jessica Tovar. If you can reset the timer for three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, go for it. Thank you, Jessica Tovar um, with the East Bay Clean Power Alliance. Um, and I do wanna make a comments that refer to the letter that we've submitted. Um, and pretty much the point of EBCE being a public agency and EBCE should therefore staff of the agency should um, present information in a neutral fashion, both to the board and also the stakeholders, the stakeholder body of the community advisory committee, the rest of the public, um, and then also the subcommittees. And one thing I just want to highlight um, is that not only should staff remain neutral, but they should also be presenting information um, in the various sides that it is to be considered. Um, to give the board and the CAC options from which to make their decisions. Um, and this is aside from their own personal um, beliefs on an issue. Um, another issue I wanna address is just personal attacks on members of the public and community organizations um, that were mentioned in this letter. Um, you know, regardless of how you view the local clean energy alliance or myself for that matter, um, 
the work that we do is to represent the community groups and community people that we work with. Um, and that should be respected as with all other members of the public. Um, and the behaviors of staff at EBCE really um, set the tone for this agency. And so how you treat the public um, really sets the tone for EBCE. So looking into the new year, I really would like to see um, this agency act like a public agency and really respect all members of the public um, as well as continue uh, operations and procedures of that of a public agency instead of uh, obstructing community organizing um, and community narratives and trying to um, really, really pit community against community. Um, I've dealt with this kind of dynamics already fighting the oil industry. So this isn't the first time I will say that it really shows that our work is very effective and obviously threatening to some people. Um, and so I will see it as an honor that, that folks have actually um, seen the effectiveness of our organization. Um, what we're trying to do here is best represent community benefits, advocacy for community benefits for our communities, and we will continue to do so. Clean power to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and Ryan Pickering, <coughs> I will recognize you for three minutes if you want to reset that timer. <coughs> Thank you so much. Go for it, Ryan. Thank you, Anne. My name, my name is Ryan Pickering. I'm a resident of Berkeley and a member of NICE Club on campus at UC Berkeley. NICE stands for Nuclear is Clean Energy. We are a student club that is open to the public that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on campus in Dwinell Hall. A nuclear is Clean Energy is uh, one of the newest clubs on campus, and it's centered around um, a priority to decarbonize our energy system for the sake of a livable planet. And we take truth uh, very seriously, and we're doing our best to share new data about nuclear energy, which suggests that it is needed to decarbonize our society. And as someone who was formerly anti-nuclear energy, I can say that this transition has been challenging for me. Um, I work in the solar power industry and you know, I had a lot of mentors who taught me that nuclear energy was excessively dangerous or, or expensive. And what we're seeing now is uh, nuclear energy has been proven to be clean in Diablo Canyon and all nuclear power plants in California. And while we only have one nuclear power plant currently, it's possible that we could have more in the future. And in fact, a lot of folks at the California Public Utilities Commission have mentioned the possibility of adding new nuclear in a world where that was legalized. Um, I, I'm calling today as a Berkeley resident who is you know, uh, struggling to keep up <laughs> with his bills. And um, you know, I, I see that the cost of energy is growing up, going up in California and nationwide. And I see an opportunity for East Bay Community Energy to partner with Diablo Canyon Power Plant to lower our bills while still delivering on the clean energy demanded by my community. And you know, I know that this has been a, a complex issue in the past, as another caller had mentioned. Um, but, you know, we're all learning and growing together and we're, you know, this is a complex world we live in. And, uh, you know, I hope that the work at our club on campus and, um, you know, some of the publications we're seeing around us will encourage our community to give a second look to nuclear as a, as a form of social justice by lowering energy bills in our community instead of increasing them without forfeiting our um, our drive towards clean energy. So I thank everyone and I really appreciate uh, the, the opportunity uh, to share my perspective about clean energy in the state of California and in the East Bay. Thanks everyone. 
Thank you. There's no further public comment. Thank you. And did we receive any written comment prior to 5 p.m. yesterday? Um, yes, we did. We did receive a letter from uh, Jessica Tovar. Um, would you like me to read this? Yes, please. To the public? Yep. Okay, we'll set the timer for two minutes. Um, let's do it for three. Yeah. Okay. Great. This letter is uh, dated December 12th, 2022. Hindrance to community engagement with East Bay Community Energy. Dear EBCE Board of Directors, East Bay Clean Power Alliance, the Alliance, is writing to express concerns regarding the cooperation between the foundational representatives that comprise East Bay Community Energy, the Board of Directors, agency staff, the Community Advisory Committee, and the Community Served. When all partners work together, EBCE customers get the best energy services uh, and the agency flourishes. Behaviors have been observed in some EBCE staff that are contrary to this mutual cooperation, including non-neutral behavior in presentation of information and efforts to limit public engagement or disparage constituent groups. The competence and hard work of EBCE staff has resulted in four years of reliable energy procurement for the customers in its jurisdiction. In particular, the Alliance would like to recognize the agency's effort to, re uh, to relieve utility debt during and after the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. The Alliance also recognizes efforts made by local development business plan staff who prioritized robust community engagement efforts on proposed and ongoing projects. In a public agency, information is presented by staff in a neutral fashion to the board, its subcommittees, the CAC and the public. The information is put out for the various stakeholders to weigh in from their perspectives and, put, um, and to put public discussion. The board receives this feedback and makes a decision which uh, staff implement. Public agency staff should present information on policy options and the potential consequences of those actions in a factual and impartial way and ultimately implement board decisions. Staff are not supposed to push their own agendas or their own, excuse me, their own opinions, nor interfere with constituent input or community engagement on policy and program decisions. Public agency staff are certainly not supposed to secure uh, board support for proposals before the public has even been informed about those proposals. Since 2019, certain information has been presented by EBCE staff in a misleading and biased way, uh, accompanied by personal attacks by staff in public forums and uh, board meetings against members of the public. This became a significant issue, particularly during the discussions regarding the proposal to buy an allocation of nuclear energy from PG&E's Diablo Canyon uh, power plant. Uh, Biased presentation of information makes it difficult for board for the board to make a decision based on complete information. Staff's biased, factually incorrect presentations were targeted to undermine public engagement. During consideration of the nuclear allocation, CEO Chassett put together a rebuttal of a fact sheet the Alliance had put together uh, after consultation with many energy experts. His, re uh, his rebuttal, uh, excuse me, his rebuttal reiterated most of the misinformation he had presented to the board. At an Albany Council meeting on the nuclear issue, uh, a member of the EPCE staff spoke immediately after the Alliance's um, organizer. Uh, there is perhaps another page of material. Should I continue? Would you like me to continue? How many pages have you read so far? Um, uh, one page. It's a three so, page. Uh, so, it took you three minutes to read one page or three minutes to read two pages? Uh, one and a half page. So it's a, so another three minutes perhaps to- We have a, just, I would just finish it, go for it. Okay. Um, thanks. Great. Uh, his rebuttal reiterated most of the misinformation he had presented to the board. <laughs> An Albany City Council meeting on the nuclear issue, a member of EBCE staff spoke immediately after the Alliance's organizer. He identified as EBCE staff and insulted her using condescending language to discredit the speaker. The information being presented by the Alliance organizer was both factually accurate and a representation of constituent groups and technical experts weighing in during the public engagement process designed for such input. It is inappropriate for a public agency staff member to undermine public speakers, especially while identifying as staff of EBCE. A recent public records request revealed a page long email written by CEO Chassett on June 9th, 2022, in direct response to the Alliance's letters and LCEA newsletters opposing the $15 million uh, gift to UCSF uh, Binioff. 
The email by CEO Chassett urged the board to support the $15 million gift, clearly violating the norm of neutrality for public agency staff. On June 15, 2022, CEO Chassett sent a second email to all board members except the CEO, the CAC representatives, which began by calling out Jessica Tavar by name as requesting meetings with board members. Chassett went on to counter that what he claimed were mischaracterizations by, quote, LCEA, Local Clean Energy Alliance, in the letter. The Alliance experienced a lack of response to meeting requests uh, from board members following that email. Staff should not interfere with the board members meeting with constituent and stakeholder groups about issues, excuse me, that come before the board. The public records request PRR for all documents exchanged between EBCE board and staff regarding the proposed $15 million gift to UCSF Binioff also yielded a significant amount of communication between staff and board members about the proposed $15 million gift, much of which occurred before the item was even made public. Results also included evidence of staff hostility towards the Alliance and evidence that staff monitor the actions of East Bay Clean Power Alliance and the local power, power chapter of the Sierra Club an EBCPA member organization regarding EBCE proposals. Community engagement with EBCE has been inhibited in ways that affect community members and organizers other than East Bay Clean Power Lines. Uh, the EBCE clerk was instructed not to distribute public comment to board members as they come in, but to wait until noon on the day of the scheduled board meeting, virtually eliminating the ability of board members to consider community input before decisions are made. However, letters supporting staff positions, such as those supporting the $15 million gift to UCSF Benioff, seem to have been forwarded to board members as they come in. On one occasion, members of the public supporting staff proposals were given preferential treatment and public speaking opportunities. Public advocacy by East Bay Clean Power Alliance, community members and organizations, with the cooperation of elected officials and Alameda, Alameda County staff, is largely responsible for the existence of EBCE. Since 2015, East Bay Clean Power Alliance has been the most active community-based organization representing BIPOC and other uh, underrepresented communities within EBCE territory. Our members include many energy experts. Um, our alliances include some who have worked within the energy sector for decades. Our advocacy is always through the lens of racial and social justice. We expect and have largely received respectful consideration of our efforts from EBCE staff and from board members in the decision-making process. The Alliance envisioned an East Bay Community Energy Agency built around the common goals listed in the JPA agreement and implemented as a joint project between the board of directors, the agency staff, and the community served. Hostility to community advocacy should not be acceptable in a public agency, and we urge the EBCE board of directors to take action to ensure that all entities, board, staff, CAC, and community can work together for the benefit of the people EBCE serves. Sincerely, uh, Jessica uh, Tovar, East Bay Community, uh, East Bay Clean Power Lines. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. That is, um, all right. Um, do we have further public comment? Any other thing? I mean, we already did the hands raised, but um, did we receive anything else in writing? Uh, there is no further written public comment. Great. Um, <clears throat> all right, then we will move on to the next agenda item. Once I get that pulled back up, because I accidentally closed that tab. Um, there it is. Uh, this will be approval of minutes from number November 14th, 2022. I'll be seeking a motion and a second and any comments. I'll move to approve the minutes. Was that Jim? Yes. Uh, so moved by member Lutz. Is there a second? I shall second, thank you. Seconded by member Hernandez. Are there any discussions or amendments on this item? Uh, yes, this is uh, Member Landry. Um, I I agree with uh, the minutes. However, we did discuss that uh, we would might need to revisit the time of the meeting, um, as I recall, um, because uh, previously we we were meeting at seven o'clock and not at um, 
six. So if we go back in person, yep. you know. Yes, yeah. if um, there will be several considerations. Um, if we go back in person, we will have a very robust discussion on, on what that means. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, member who? Yes, I also agree with the minutes. I'm curious, I, um, I understand for the purpose of the minutes that kind of topics and suggestions from this body are just summarized in very succinct bullet points. Just curious if there are like more detailed notes that staff in particular take and take back um, as guidance from the CAC. Thanks. Um, I know that uh, <clears throat> that the recordings are um, posted online, but as far as more specific notes, um, I imagine that, and I'll, I guess I'll turn this to staff, but my, my understanding is that um, if staff are gathering input on specific items that they take that feedback um, in more specific notes for their own work, um, but that the, um, if we're, you know, if we're just looking at what we're going to have to work with, um, and it's not specific to an agenda item, that um, more detailed notes are not taken. But I, I guess Alex, could you help us with that question? Uh, I think you, I think you've covered it pretty well, Children. Lisa, does that help? Not really. Um, like, okay. are you looking? For, are you looking for more specific notes on the top on specific topics? I I think I was curious if there are if I will just hold my comments. I apologize. I don't want us to get stuck on this right now. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll follow up with you after. Um, all right. So we have a. Uh, motion and a second. Are, is there any public comment on this item or any uh, written comment that has been um, submitted prior to 5 p.m. yesterday? There is no public comment and we've received no items, no written public uh, comment for this item. All right, seeing no members of the public with their hands raised, can we please call a roll call vote? Yes, thank you. Member Landry. Yes. Member Hugh. Yes. Member Lou. Yes. Member Smallmanathon. Yes. Member Lachman. Yes. Member Taria. Yes. Hold on one second. Um, Member Pacheco. Yes. Member Susan. Yes. Member Hernandez. Yes. Member Lutz. Yes. Chair Elder. Chair Elder. The space bar is not working. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, our next agenda item is the CAC chair report. And so <clears throat> I apologize to you for all this going on here. Um, normally I would go with old business and then new, I guess I can still do that. So um, I wanted to bring back an item uh, from that we discussed at the last CAC meeting. And uh, it was heard at the executive committee meeting. We had some pretty substantive discussion around the CAC and its relationship with staff. And so um, it was heard at the um, executive committee meeting. Um, thank you to everyone who participated in that discussion. Uh, we do have a formal recommendation that came out of that committee meeting, which is the executive committee recommended an ad hoc committee be formed to address the issue of how to manage requests from the CAC. 
the uh, specifically requests that are not on um, the board's agenda or um, like specifically timely with uh, an agenda item or priority being set forth by the board. Um, the ad hoc committee is not likely to be created until the new year. Uh, and part of this is that we will be working with the new chair um, of the board and, um, and because there's so many board members that are turning over, uh, like their terms have ended or um, they have been elected to a different office or they um, did not seek reelection this term. Um, so their position on the, uh, on the board of directors is ending. And so um, new appointments to the board are expected over the course of the next two months. Like each city has a slightly different process for us to learn who our new members are gonna be. Um, and so it's based on their standard process. Um, and then uh, after that is done, they will get new committee assignments. So this, it's gonna take a little bit, but the, um, the new chair of the board was present at the executive committee meeting and said that he will be working with the chair of the CAC to, um, to come up with a process. Um, and, um, and so that's the official thing. I did really wanna take a couple things that I heard in that meeting though, and just highlight them um, because they're good process uh, points that were brought up. One of them is how um, in general, if we're, we're making requests that it should be something that like we vote on. Um, so like a group request as opposed to not a singular, um, like not an individual making a request, but a group, um, like a CAC request, which is by and large how things have worked. Um, we either agendize the items or, um, or there's enough discussion and interest from a majority of board members that that's when we move forward with things. Uh, but just to kind of keep that in mind um, and that, um, that, you know, I, as, as chair, I really try and hold items until they are timely for the organization, um, till they match up at least somewhat with what's going on with um, the board agenda or, um, or there's a, a, another specific priority that's happening that we really have to work with. And so um, just to kind of keep those things in mind, um, the, we will be working with um, the executive committee and the, the ad hoc committee to, to figure out how to do this. So I just wanted to give you all an update on that. Um, and I have requested to be part of that ad hoc committee. We'll see how the new chair feels about that. So um, Cynthia, I see your hand raised on this item. So do you have a comment? Cynthia, I see your hand has gone down on this item. Um, no, my, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that was premature. Um, I attended that board meeting and, um, you know, I think that some of my comments will, uh, they kind of coincide with uh, what I felt the, the letter that was written by the, the local clean energy uh, regarding, you know, uh, staff being neutral. I, and I say that and all do respect. I want to be very clear uh, about that. Uh, I feel that uh, as a member of this body uh, that we need to vet inf information. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, I, I have no problem us, you know, voting on our uh, requests you know, we'll, we'll either get, you know, enough votes or we won't. That's perfectly fine. And that's apparently what the board does. So I have no problem with that. Uh, I think that uh, we, are, uh, we are in parity actually 
with the JPA board. And, and, and what I mean is the public versus the uh, ad administration. Uh, I feel that uh, this is a chilling effect, my own personal opinion, on our uh, ability to uh, vet um, items. And, uh, and I'm looking at the work plan now. Uh, and what I don't like, I'm just gonna read it, uh, act as a guide to assist the CAC chair and members uh, to focus CAC meetings. I, I, I think, uh, I think that um, as a body, we do uh, a good job. And uh, I say this and I'll do res respect. We wanna work collaboratively with the board, uh, with the public and with our staff has co-equals to make the best decisions possible uh, for the residents of Alameda County. Uh, so um, that's my um, uh, comment. I don't think that uh, we need somebody, excuse my expression, to um, monitor our actions or perhaps babysit uh, our, our actions. So, um, you know, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. And uh, so I think, you know, we should, you know, work collaboratively, but also has a, a body vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the um, JPA board. Um, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I, uh, I do wanna make sure that I did not misspeak there are not additional requirements that are put on us at this time. We would be operating as we have been, but being mindful. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> the, yes. And um, I think that what, so I was, I attended this meeting in public and one of the things that I heard really strongly is that a primary objective um, is to, uh, make sure that staff are protected from having to make political decisions around um, what is a priority and what is not a priority. So I think the spirit of that is a good thing. Um, and I will definitely note um, the uh, identification with um, the spirit of cooperation and, and wanting to work collaboratively with the board, the public and the staff to make the best decisions possible for our our customers, um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, there you go. Um, uh, Ernie? Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you for your report back. Um, I caught about the last 15 minutes of the executive committee meeting, but I missed most of it. So thank you for that uh, report back. Um, the one, point that you made about the CAC taking a vote on the items to ask uh, staff to work on. I, my initial reaction to that is that that sounds fine to me. But I have a question. Um, there, there was something that staff has already done some work on, and it's part of our work plan, which is uh, monitor, monitoring our, our metrics on job creation. And I, I had asked previously about some kind of metrics on what kind of union, what kind of job creation, including union creation, union jobs we've had. I know staff has already done some work on that. I'm hoping that we can, I can get some of that information before we go through the whole process that you're talking about. Can you tell me where that, what, where that is? Or, yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, GP is awesome. Um, GP had identified that uh, that metrics were something that we had um, agreed on. They're part of staff um, like priorities, but, but that he did not have capacity um, to like, that he thought that he had it ready. We had him agendized to do that, but um, then the data came back kind of weird and it wasn't the way that he was expecting it. And so um, every month we brought an update on that, like, um, boy, do I understand that. Like uh, this is not telling us the thing that we thought it would, or this information is revealing that we don't understand something and then hasn't had the ability or the capacity to follow up on that. So um, they've hired 
or we're hiring in the process of hiring somebody to um, to be able to do some of that work. And maybe Alex can give us an update on um, if that position has been filled. <clears throat> I'm not sure yet. There, I'm not sure on the status of, of that position, but um, but I do know that we have provided um, some of the information that Member Pacheco had asked for. Uh, I think ahead of the last CAC meeting, mm -hmm. and we sent it out. It was the it was like an email table that was like I think it had information on like eight or nine different projects, and the rest of them are pending because. Um, and but it was number of jobs. I don't I don't remember if it was number of those were number of union jobs, right? It was it was union labor hours, and and those were um, the most up to date numbers we have. The the pending has to do with projects that are just not not built right. yet. Yep, absolutely, they haven't been built yet. Um, but but those are projects that we will see hours on in the future. Okay. Well, yep. cl uh, clarification. So so thank you. So just clarification for me because I've been waiting to report back. Um, those numbers that were sent on the email, those are okay, those are now public. I wasn't quite sure because it seemed like there was some hesitation there. And then also there was seemed to be some uncertainty about whether those numbers were or were not indeed union jobs. That sounds like something, if my understanding is correct, that that's still unknown and we're waiting for possibly an additional staff member to um, be able to determine. No, no, I think those are two separate things and I'm sorry if I conflated them. Um, my understanding is that those were union hours. Yes. And, um, but as far as like the greater metrics that we were talking about being developed, that was a, a plan that was developed through the two years of Mary and Jane um, being chair and vice chair. They worked with staff to create, like how are we gonna be measuring the success of projects? Um, uh, from the local development business plan. Like this is definitely something that is part of our work plan that was like asked, the board asked us to like dig into these things. Like that's been a pretty specific um, directive from them. Um, and the development of those metrics is something that uh, is, is on hold until there's a staff, um, staff capacity for it. Uh, but those, those numbers, like the in general job numbers, that's what they had. Okay, thank no, thank you. Yeah, and the, and the metrics that um, th those other metrics are much more difficult. And I understand how it's going to take a while to to come up with those. Um, la last last question. So, okay, now that I know that those are the official numbers and they are all our union jobs, because I wasn't quite sure. The the one remaining question, and we can pick this up in whatever bureaucratic way is appropriate moving forward, is what unions a, a breakdown of what unions got those jobs from the projects. And, and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I'll need to check with the board chair on that. Um, Cause that's a little bit in the air right now, unless staff has a really easy way to do that. I don't know. Um, uh, Member Hernandez. Thank you, chair. Thank you very much for the report. We'll comment later on the letter. Um, in regards to the work yeah. plan, I was, just we we just and to be clear, y'all, that is just the report, the first bullet point of my report back. Um, this is just on this item, and then we'll do the rest of the report. Yeah, I think I appreciated having the attachment uh, in regards to the work plan. So I think that was where this item was attached to showing the uh, community advisory committee work plan approved maybe 2018, and there was some video there from 2017 that showed right, what's the scope of work versus a work plan. The scope of work just really, you know, bracketed what the CAC was about. The work plan is sort of more a guide, which is nice to know that sort of the framework we have. And I noticed in one of the meeting agenda items talked about the stipend and having staff or the CEO come back and, you know, provide those reports on the operation of the authority, but they didn't really talk about funding and supporting I would say staff person or contracts anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand dollars to carry out the CAC duties. You know, as something that maybe is it sort of um, quantified the level of resources this CAC receives to sort of help carry the will and the digging into um, things that maybe come through the board or come through the committee or through the community. So I think that's something that's open to maybe discuss further. But I just want to bring that to the committee's attention. That's something in, in doing prep work here saw that video, 
the recording that's on the website. Thank you, Adrian, for that direction. In regards to something that was out there for consideration, not only the stipend, the CEO reporting out, but funding and supporting the CAC, maybe not to exceed $50,000, but I couldn't find that that was ever approved in the previous minutes or if somehow we're qualifying the level of support the committee's getting. Um, the just my comments. funny thing is I attached the uh, election process and the scope for the agenda item about electing a vice chair. But I'm glad that people wow. read it because that's really cool. And it does overlay with this topic for sure. Um, and I can do some more digging because we have, um, you know, we have quite a lot of notes from founding around um, around supports. Again, we don't have any specific things that have been given to us right now. It's being referred to an ad hoc committee. Um, so it's just being referred to an ad hoc committee. Um, so the purpose so chair was, was just for the VP, excuse me, the vice chair role, because I thought I was like, oh, here's an overview comprehensive document that I previously on the board never saw. So my apologies for the interruption, but it's good to see this. No, it's it's great. And um, that was voted on by the board um, and adopted. Like we did the first work plan. Um, I'm actually going to cover that in this next uh, part of my report back, if that's cool. Uh, so I just want to let you know that um, our relationship with staff time um, is going to go to an ad hoc committee. That, um, that we should not expect that to be super fast because we are in a time of transition for the board, um, that it's gonna take a couple months for our new members to get seated, um, but I'll be in communication with the chair um, as we take a look at this. Uh, so I just wanted you all to be up to, up to date on that. Um, but this next board meeting has a lot of transition, um, which I will cover here in a second. Um, I, uh, but before I get into that, I really, uh, the first thing I want to do is elect a new vice chair. That, um, that is specifically the next item that I want to do as, oh, wait a minute, that's on the agenda, isn't it, Adrian? Okay, great. Then I'm going to skip that part. Ignore me completely. Um, and so the next board meeting, um, they're going to be discussing a couple items that are not on the CAC agenda. Uh, specifically, uh, there's like some contracts, there's a thing with Google, like there's a way for them to save a bunch of money using Google Cloud um, and, you know, contracts going into that kind of thing. Um, there is uh, specifically an update with Block Power, which uh, it's adopting a resolution authorizing the CEO to negotiate and execute the first amendment to the loan agreement and the incentive agreement with Block Power to expand customer eligibility for the healthy healthy home program and to update the repayment schedule for the loan. Um, and since Block Power is something that we've discussed here quite a bit, I just wanted you to know that they're going to be discussing that on Wednesday. If you want to go representing yourself, um, since this is not an item that we're taking action on on this agenda, then um, you're you're welcome to make comments on that item. Um, and also that EVCE will be receiving the US EPA National Notable Achievement Award. And so just want to uh, give kudos to staff and recognize that, um, that we are being uh, recognized um, for some creativity and um, uh, incentive. I believe that's around the EV charging program. Is that right, Alex? That that sounds right. <laughs> All right. If I remember that one correctly, it's not linked on the agenda. So um, the the information I was able to get, I believe it's around the EV charging program, but um, really well done. And y'all should know that we're getting another award. Um, and the next part here will be um, like I, I, we received a communication um, that was discussed during public comment. Thank you for reading that. Adrian, um, normally we would not have time to read that length of a response, but this agenda is really pretty um, small. Uh, there were some pretty serious allegations that were made in that letter, 
And I, I really do want to appreciate um, that staff accomplishments and cooperation was highlighted both in the letter and in public comment. Um, and that the history of cooperation between the board, the CAC staff, county and city electeds and the public was highlighted. Um, uh, but there's some pretty serious stuff in there and I'm gonna be following up with East Bay Clean Power Alliance about some of the specifics that for me were very concerning to hear about. Um, actions on becoming of a public agency and that kind of stuff, those are very serious things. Um, specifically around disparaging comments um, in public or attacks on customers and members of the public, um, monitoring of community group activities, staff solicitation of support of agenda items. Um, those are those are some those are some pretty like those are some pretty heavy uh, statements that were made, and I am going to be requesting to take a look at the findings of the public record request that I think um, Tom Kelly put forth because um, those are those are some pretty big things. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the the heft of that and um, and say that I will be following up because because that's a big deal actually. Um, so that is all for the chair report. Um, are there, is there any public comment on that? Um, or have we received any written comment on it prior to 5 p.m. yesterday? There are no hands raised for public comment and we have not received any written public comment for this item. All right. Um, then uh, we have a comment from staff, um, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Chair Eldred. Yeah, yeah, I'm having just seen that that letter myself. It, it is pretty disconcerting. Um, I, I just feel like I have to say I'm not aware of. I'd be interested to know what what the the context is of staff dis disparaging members of the public. That's not something that our staff engages in. Um, and so to, to, to see that accusation is pretty unsettling. Yeah. Um, we see ourselves as public servants that you know, and ultimately we are accountable to, to the public, our communities and our constituents. So um, you know, I, do, I, do, I do look forward to hopefully getting to, to clear the record on that because that's not something that our staff engages in. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, member Lutz. Um, this is, it's not so much about that, but about, uh, the, the work plan and the documents you sent on how, um, that those processes need to be updated to account for the expansion to include Stockton of how CAC members are selected and chosen. And I was a little concerned that the process of selecting CAC representatives is limited to just geographical interest, you know, various cities um, or the proposed one, but it's not, doesn't make sure that there's a representative representation of broad sort of sectoral interests of, you know, labor, faith, environmental justice of those sorts of perspectives so it's um it's not a burning issue right now but it's something i think we should address of how do you make sure that the cac brings in a wide range of a wide enough range of perspectives to be useful and to be helpful and that's all um, that's that's really that's really helpful, um, especially I, because I know they will be taking a look at it. Do you mind um, writing up a little thing and emailing it to me? I could, yeah. Thank you. And if you don't need it right away, um, I do not need it right away, okay. but soon would be helpful. Yeah. Great, um, uh, Member Landry. Um, yes. Um, 
almost forgot what I was going to say, but um, yes, the ad, I have two points. The ad hoc committee, uh, who is that going to be comprised of? Is that an ad hoc committee of the uh, JPA, the board, or does that include um, some of the CAC members here? Um, so the, um, the definition of an ad hoc committee is a group that is appointed outside of a regular um, committee meeting. It's not a Brown Act body. It is um, a smaller, usually working group. Um, and uh, it is made up of whoever the board um, chair decides is on it. Um, they appoint somebody. Um, I've made a request that a member of this body be on it, and we will see if that request is heard or not, but that's definitely how that goes. Okay, um, and then regarding, um, you know, staff conduct, um, what I, what I want to say is um, just uh, say that um, I think that um, I've noticed, and I will speak for myself, sometimes uh, a bias in the presentation. And I think that uh, to properly vet an item, we need to have both the pros um, and, you know, both sides of, of the issue. And lastly, um, I also think since EBCE, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very fortunate that is a, that it is a very well managed um, body, but I think that we can we should consider, um, if need be, uh, for our various requests. And I don't think we're overdoing it. Perhaps uh, perhaps the board should consider hiring an uh, additional staff person uh, assigned to the CAC. Uh, you know, to uh, assist us with our various uh, inf information uh, requests. Maybe we need to, you know, have, have an additional staff person uh, as opposed to having uh, oversight in what we are uh, requesting. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I will make sure to carry those comments forward. I, um, we just don't have enough information requests that I'm guessing to warrant an entire staff. Um, but, uh, but we are definitely looking at ways to increase cooperation and collaboration. And that is something that will definitely be brought out in the, um, in the communications with the chair. So um, I'm really, your input is super valuable and I really appreciate it. And um, I'll make sure to, to bring those, those comments forward. So thank you, Cynthia. Um, <coughs> Um, I am looking to see if I've missed any major um, updates from the board. And, um, oh yeah, the uh, Healthy Communities partnership uh, was approved like it like the 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 staff recommendation for um, it was agenda item 14 was approved and uh, which this body supported um, and um, and I mean that's mostly that so I um, I think that we're good on that um, all right, so I, I apologies, my brain is just mush right now. Um, the next agenda item is the net energy metering discussion, which is, oh, and I do, I do wanna say guys, um, we will be bringing stuff like our scope and everything back. That is a thing that we will be discussing and um, it gets updated. And so um, there will be time. I think it's really important that we take a look at it and I'll, I will talk about it again at the um, vice chair uh, agenda item. So. Um, the net energy metering discussion. Actually, Adrian, do you mind moving the vice chair appointment up because it would be really helpful to have the vice chair role happening right now? Absolutely. So 
with all y'all's permission, we're going to go to agenda item C6, which is the appointment of a vice chair, and then we will have the um, the brief informational update item on the net energy metering next. So, um, uh, rather unfortunately, there was a conflict uh, with Vice Chair Mutzenberg, and he um, had to step down from the CAC. And um, this does actually leave us without a full-time representative for um, for Tracy. And um, there's a time conflict with the um, the alternate. So we're taking a look at what that's going to look like. Um, but uh, but we do need to elect a, a vice pre a vice chair for um, the duration of William's term. Um, and we asked if folks were interested to uh, reply by email. Um, if Cynthia, can I have you lower your hand real quick? Unless it's still up for a reason, or you're about to volunteer yourself or something. All right. Um, if uh, <clears throat> if anyone has not responded by email um, and is interested in the position of vice chair, can you raise your hand now or just speak up? If you have responded by email, then we will recognize you in just a moment. But if um, if you have not responded by email but are interested, let us know now. Such resounding uh, response. All right. So, um, uh, Adrian, can you let us know who's responded by email? Um, we received a, uh, a response from um, Ed Hernandez. Or member Hernandez. Excellent. Um, then I would like to nominate uh, member Hernandez to be vice chair. Is there a second? I'll second uh, Cynthia Landry. Excellent. Um, member Souza, did you, you had your hand up for a second? Oh, no, I'm just excited. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, just wait for the vote. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, Member Hernandez, you uh, accept the nomination? I do, thank you. Excellent, can we have a roll call vote? Yes, thank you. Member Landry? Yes. Member Hugh? Yes. Member Lou? Yes. Member Swaminathan? An enthusiastic yes. Member Lakshman? Yes. Member Taria? Member Tauria? Member Pacheco? Yes. Member Susan? Yes. Member, uh, Member Carr? Member Hernandez? Yes, thank you. Member Lutz? Yes. Chair Lutz? Uh, that's a yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the appointment is approved. Awesome. Thank Member again, Vice everybody. Chair Hernandez, welcome aboard. I need you to take notes. <laughs> Starting now or next meeting? Starting right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll show you after the meeting what we do here. But um, if, uh, but yeah, if you could try and capture this, it would be lovely. Um, and thank you so much for being willing to step up. And before we move on, I attached the um, the CAC uh, appointment process and the um, scope of work that was approved by the board um, to the chair report instead of the correct agenda item, apologies, um, although they really do flow together. And I'm hoping that folks can take a real look at it. Uh, the direction that's been given to us by the board that uh, was, Oh, so it was the result of more hours than I can even summarize accurately here. Um, the getting uh, a CAC established, having it be as robust and strong as this one, um, having the level of cooperation is something that is a direct result of um, both community advocacy and dedication from our elected officials uh, to creating something that was truly better. 
Uh, they're not interested in doing things the way that they have always been done or even the way that they're done everywhere else. We want to do better because we hold ourselves to a higher standard and we can. Uh, and we can show that the dream of the CAC is something that is very material. So California's um, electric grid has seen dramatic uh, reductions in carbonization since um, the arrival of CACs. And um, very much the investor-owned utilities have had to um, do quite a lot to compete with CACs in, in this area. So their decarbonization is also strongly a result of our work. And you should be really, really proud of that. Um, it's a narrative I don't see out there as often as it should be. Um, but when, when PG&E lost half of their customers, they shed a lot of their um, uh, carbon and other pollutant uh, intensive uh, energy resources. And um, that is the result of what the CACs are doing. So uh, if not for the PCIA, we'd be able to see even more the dramatic cost savings that uh, staff uh, across the state have been able to realize for customers um, and uh, the amount of local benefits um, really differs by CCA, but um, are still better than anything we've ever seen. So um, like there's there's something really powerful here. And uh, specifically, we've been asked to take a look at social, environmental, and economic um, pillars. Like the, the foundations of our work should have a balanced portfolio of social, economic, and environmental um, uh, benefits that are to our community and um, recognizing our community's role in, um, in a greater planet, right? So um, being part of this thing is a uh, absolute honor. And um, it's a little worrisome to me that more folks aren't willing to step up and look at um, leadership because it's actually just amazing. Uh, so I, I encourage all of you to really take a look at what this is, what our roles are. I'm recognizing that if if um, Vice Chair Hernandez, who at one point was on the board, doesn't remember this thing that probably our current board members don't either, and also probably our CAC members don't either. So really do take a look at it. Like it's pretty specific and it was crafted in a very transparent, very inclusive process. And um and it means a lot uh, for me. So um, I was able to lead the last update of it. Um, Member Lutz, you're completely accurate in that it needs to be updated to reflect our um, our expanded staff, um, uh, staff, our expanded membership um, and territory. And then, um, so have it take a look and really uh, see see where the, the heart of this came from and where we're trying to go. So um, it will, you know, this will come back at some point. And um, I just wanted people to know what this is and then really think about um, whether or not you're able to, in the future, look at um, being a chair or a vice chair um, or something. So uh, if, if folks have more comments on that, then we'll gladly hear them. If not, um, feel free to reach out to me specifically on any questions that you have um, or areas after you've had a chance to read it that you want to um, that you want to get clarification on or you think is sort of problematic or you don't understand uh, because public agencies are living, breathing things and they evolve. Um, and they evolve because their members and the public advocate for their evolution. So um, that's my little thing on, this thing is so important to me and I love it so much. And it's a huge honor to be part of it. And I want you to um, really start considering whether or not you would be willing to be part of future leadership. So um, that's that for that agenda item. Thanks for letting us do that first. Um, so the net energy uh, metering discussion is an informational, and I understand a brief informational item um, that is being presented this evening by, I should know this answer, 
<laughs> um, hi, it's me. I don't, I don't believe I've had the opportunity to meet most of the folks on this call, but my name is Michael Quiroz. I am a relatively new member of EBCE's public policy team, and I cover our regulatory affairs as they pertain to distributed energy resources. And as such, I've been following uh, the new net energy metering proposals pretty closely. And we wanted to uh, sort of prepare a, a brief presentation to give some updates on that process. So Adrian, if you could go to the next slide. So this is a broad sort of overview of how net energy metering, metering excuse me, has come to be in its present form. As you can see uh, in 1995, California established the first net metering program, um, the first in California, for small solar customers through the passage of SB 656. And between, between 1995 and 2016, there were several incremental policy changes. In 2016, uh, NEM 2.0 came around. This is the sort of current paradigm of net metering rates under which uh, IOU customers operate. In 2021, the CPUC released a proposal for the sort of new paradigm of that energy metering, NEM 3.0. Uh, that proposal did not come to a vote. Instead, in 2022, an alternative proposal was released, and it could be adopted by the CPUC on December 15th. If approved, this proposal would be implemented within a year. EBCE, among other CCAs, is submitting comments on this proposal. And to the right here, um, there's a quick plot sort of describing the increase in installed capacity of behind the meter net energy metering solar as compared with falling median residential solar system prices and increasing uh, sort of retail rates for residential customers, generally um, painting a, a favorable a favorable environment for behind the metering net, uh, behind the meter NEM solar. Next slide, please. So there are several key issues um, when drafting a successor to NEM 2.0, such as how much should we pay customers for excess electricity that they send back to the grid? How can you promote sustainable growth of solar adoption? What type of rate should NEM customers be enrolled in? How should we recover costs associated with distribution and grid maintenance? How should potential cost shifts be addressed? How should uh, we ensure that low income customers have access to distributed generation and storage? And finally, how to balance the costs and benefits associated with distributed generation. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but in drafting a revision to the existing NEM policy, the CPUC must consider several different design aspects and competing priorities. Next slide, please. So we wanted to give a sort of issue by issue comparison of the 2021 proposed decision released in, I believe, December of last year, and the new 2022 proposed decision released in November, which uh, might be voted on in on uh, December 15th. So when it comes to export compensation, which is how much customers are paid for the excess energy they send back to the grid, both decisions uh, would compensate customers at a lower rate. It would be based on avoided costs. Um, the difference here is that in the 2021 proposed decision, those rates would be locked in for the first five years, whereas in 2022, those rates would be locked in for the first nine years. The second key issue is the glide path approach, um, which sort of describes how to ensure the sustainable growth of solar adoption. We wanna move um, not abruptly, but sort of have a gliding path towards the new um, net energy metering uh, tariff. So in the 2021 proposed decision, customers would receive a monthly bill credit that would be available for the first four years and would step down by 25% each year. In the new decision, customers would receive an additional um, sort of dollar amount for each unit of energy they sell back to the grid, which would be available for the first five years, stepping down by 20% each year. Another thing we wanted to look at is rate structure. What kind of rates should then customers be enrolled in? In the 2021 decision, customers were required to use time of use rates, um, and there were no changes to billing or interconnection fees. Um, in the new proposed decision, Likewise, there are no changes to billing or interconnection fees, but customers are required to use electrification rates. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Here's our last set of issues. So fixed charges, how should we recover costs associated with the distribution and grid maintenance? The 2021 post decision required them customers to pay a monthly fixed charge for 10 years. There is no similar fixed charge in the new 2022 proposed decision. 
um, when it comes to equity in the 2021 proposed decision, uh, low income customers were exempt from that proposed fixed charge. Again, that's no longer um, sort of existing in the new decision, um, as well as um, low income customers were allowed to enroll in any rate they wanted, not just time of use. In the 2022 proposed decision, low income customers receive even more money for each unit of energy they sell back to the grid. And finally, um, there was an issue of sort of other charges, how to balance the costs and benefits associated, associated with distributed solar. Uh, namely, in 2021, NEM customers were exempt from, sorry, in the 2021 proposed decision, NEM customers were exempt from many statewide charges for wildfire prevention, resiliency, resiliency et cetera. In the 2022 proposed decision, uh, they are no longer exempt from those charges. Next slide, please. So we also want to give a brief update on the positions that EBCE has taken on both of these decisions. In the first 2021 decision, uh, we had sort of three key arguments. First being that the monthly fixed charge for NEM customers is discriminatory. Instead, the CPUC should address uh, cost recovery issues by moving NEM customers to electrification rates. Uh, second, we argued that NEM customers should be subject to the same suite of statewide charges as other rate payers. And finally, um, we sort of advocated for that glide path uh, so that export rates would be based on avoided costs, um, sort of to stabilize that transition. And the CPUC adopted all of these recommendations in the 2022 proposal. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll look at the positions EBC has uh, formally commented on for the 2022 proposal. Um, First of all, we argued that utilities should be given more time to implement net energy metering 3.0, and they should be, and uh, sort of that implementation should be completed before NEM 2.0 is closed to new customers. Uh, second, we argued that funding for the glide path should only be collected from IOUs that receive glide path incentives. Um, as it stands, SDG&E rate pairs, it's a little bit ambiguous whether or not those rate pairs are required to pay into those additional incentives but it is clear that they will not receive those additional incentives. Third, uh, we argue that those glide path step downs, again, sort of the reduction in credits by 20% a year or 25% in the first decision should just step down based on installed capacity rather than sort of an arbitrary one year's uh, one value and then another year and then another year. Um, fourth, we argue that the CPUC should consider additional incentives for low income customers. And finally, we said that non-residential customers should receive the additional glide path incentives that are currently limited to residential. So um, this is all we had. We just wanted to sort of give an update on the new decision and the positions that we have taken in our official filings, along with the other joint CCAs. Thank you. Uh, thank you and welcome. Um, it's great to meet you. You as well. So, thank you for having me. Uh, so. Uh, a couple quick things. Can we get a copy of the comments that were submitted for 2022? Yes, those are publicly available, and I'm sure that is something that we can uh, distribute to the CAC. Great. Um, also, just for uh, folks on this body, can you define the term glide path? Yes, I realize that's sort of a, a jargony term. Apologies. Um, it's It's sort of the notion that um, because when you move from NEM 2.0 to NEM 3.0, those export credits that you typically get for the excess energy you send back to the grid, those will be lower. We, um, I believe the idea behind the glide path is instead of there being sort of an abrupt shift from those high credits to low credits, you want to ease that transition with a glide path, which essentially um, lowers the credits over time as it currently stands. Uh, and then I, I have a I have a comment, but it's not a clarifying question. And I want to take public comment before I make comment. Um, uh, Member Souza, do you have a clarifying question or a comment? Well, I was uh, actually going to wait for the if there was public comment, so I'll just be quiet right now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, then we do have. A member of the public with their two members of the public with their hand raised. Um, <clears throat> Clerk, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Uh, Jessica Tovar, you recognized for three minutes. 
Hi, everyone. Jessica Tovar with the East Bay Clean Power Alliance. Um, and I do want to say that we are opposed to this current proposal and um, last year's proposal, um, both of which we do see as local solar killers. Um, the only difference is the last proposal sought to kill local solar and this current proposal seeks to strangle it, but in the end you have the same result. You're killing the ability for people to um, pretty much make money or credit, which we also call building local wealth from the solar that they produce in their communities. Um, and just to highlight that this is the true clean energy in our communities. We're not talking about re remote solar. We're talking about rooftops, solar gardens, and the types of models that we wanna see in our community, like virtual net energy metering, um, solar on schools and, and, and uh, other different types of um, businesses, for example, et cetera. So um, one of the things that we wanted to, to share from the Local Clean Energy Alliance and East Bay Clean Power is that, um, you know, we do have questions on this kind of, on, this, um, on the slides that were just shared. Um, one of them is that there was no fixed charge to the persons with this rooftop solar. And my understanding is the previous proposal was charging $50 and now they're being charged um, 15. So there is actually still a fixed charge. Um, and so, you know, pretty much we have questions around what's called the avoided cost um, of rooftop solar, which is how to get accurate figures of the cost saved by having the rooftop um, system. In, and, um, one thing I want to highlight too is that local solar does not require the use of transmission lines, so it is the most affordable form of clean energy. Um, and so we really want to highlight that local solar should be saved in the state of California, and this current proposal seeks to cut, gut it by 75%. Um, the incentive, the amount of the incentive that the rooftop or local solar um, owner could get in the form of either credit or money. And so this is a direct attack on the people's power and really is about solidity, solidifying the power of the corporate utilities. Um, so we would like to see EBCE take a stronger stand and actually oppose anything that would be a local solar killer. Thank you, clean power to the people. Great. We're really going to try and keep it to the three minutes, y'all. Um, Recognize a Vaughn for three minutes. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, my take on this is um, probably quite a bit different than everybody else's uh, from what I've heard. Um, I put solar on my roof in 2000, and I wasn't expected to get paid back because they weren't paying back for that. They just trued it up once a year. Um, I was able to get off with um, not paying my gas bill for the, from September to November, and then it would they would just take the money away and cover it with the cover the gas from the the buildup. But you know, essentially, I was paying five dollars and forty cents when my neighbors were paying four hundred or five hundred dollars a month for for power because that was during the the um, big confusion in the, those years. I've since repowered the system. Um, you, the state payers, and the federal government have actually helped me pay for it. Um, I'm never expected to make money off of my uh, solar panels or make a business. Um, so that perspective of it doesn't seem to be reflected in the net paying things because uh, in, in the long run, there's no need for a pg e for residential power, especially in this area. There's enough solar power hitting everybody's roof to last you know, forever if they can store it. And the batteries are getting better, the technology is getting better. Uh, at some point, 
um, in the next, I would say 10 or 20 years, if we can, are still alive after 2050, um, then everything will go to you store the power and you, you use it off the, off the batteries and you don't need the network, except in maybe some major emergency, but even then there'll be another way to get around that. We won't need the network. You won't need PG&E. Now, some companies, big companies, big uh, you know, other users or something like that, there might be some need uh, boutique business for that. But most of the truly wealthy people are getting off of the grid and people that live away from the cities and even some in the cities, myself included, are building towards getting off the grid and not depending on it. And the technology is going that way. And pg e knows it. That's why they're trying to kill rooftop solar because they want to be in the business of building a plant someplace and transmitting it someplace because that's what they've always done. It's the same problem with nuclear and natural gas and all that kind of stuff. There's companies that make money off of selling it and transferring it and they don't want people and they, it's not to their advantage to pay their employees to do that kind of thing. And we're in a shift away from the way things have been done for the last 200 years or 150 years or so. To, to this new model. And this net metering thing is just a stopgap type of thing, trying to suppress rooftop solar. We need to go towards where everything's a grid or a grid of grids and there is no network. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brendan Pittman, Brendan Pittman, you're recognized for three minutes. Hello everyone, I'm back. Um, I'm not gonna comment on the last comment. I'm not here to talk about distributed versus centralized, um, that topic, though I do have feelings on that. Um, I just wanna, uh, hopefully members are aware of the East Bay Times editorial post from uh, Mercury News and East Bay Times. I'm just gonna read two paragraphs from that. Um, we understand that rooftop solar companies wanna maximize profits and secure their long-term future. But utilities are right when they argue that rooftop solar owners don't pay enough of the fixed costs for maintaining the grid uh, and an inequity that would continue under the proposed NEM plan. The burden of paying for power distribution, wildfire mitigation, and investing in new technologies would continue to disproportionately fall to the rest of the electricity consumers. It would perpetuate a regressive subsidy that unfairly burdens the poor. California's estimated 1.5 million rooftop solar customers who produce more than 11% of the state's total electricity production are disproportionately wealthy. And I would just ask members and staff that those uh, inequities and disproportionalities are considered when we're talking about uh, NEM3. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Audrey Ichinose, you recognized for three minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, um, I had a couple of questions and, you know, um, uh, I agree with uh, uh, the idea that uh, this NEM 3.0 pr uh, proposal is just not uh, good enough, still too extreme. Um, but I wanted to ask uh, Michael, um, what, uh, when, when you're talking about low income uh, people, um, are you understand, I, you're talking about low income households that you think can afford solar installation. I'm not clear on that. Um, uh, also, it's part of my ignorance, but what are electrification rates as opposed to um, the previous, I, I guess the 2021 uh, proposed decision. Um, so anyway, uh, if you could clarify that, I would appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, I uh, also had a question about why EBCE favors uh, a glide path that's based on capacity. And do they expect that if they, they uh, do look to capacity instead of a year yearly um, uh, demarcation that this will uh, be fast. Uh, th this will be a steeper glide path or a more gradual uh, glide path. Thank you very much. Sorry. 
Uh, great, thank you. Um, Ryan Pickering, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you. I also read the editorial in the East Bay Times that was published today entitled California Must Level Rooftop Solar Playing Field. And I was surprised by the opinion stated, you know, generally we feel that, you know, all barriers should be lifted to solar. But the author argues, as the previous caller also read, I, I suppose, from the same article, that, you know, this does represent a regressive tax and that most of the people benefiting from rooftop solar are wealthy people and a minority of low income people are benefiting from it as well. And, you know, I, I've been installing solar panels for 13 years for Sun Power Corporation, Real Good Solar, Akina Solar, Northern Pacific Power Systems here in Berkeley and abroad. And what I can say is, you know, rich people definitely are getting solar because it represents a way for them to save a lot of money. And now they are adding batteries, just as the former caller said. But what they're not doing is going off grid. These, when you install solar plus storage on your home, you are still connected to the grid and you enjoy the benefits of the grid. And I don't think folks really understand that to a deep level. Um, you cannot disconnect from the grid um, without hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even then, you would need the grid or backup generators when the sun doesn't come out for a few days, which does happen. And so, you know, I think we need to be honest with ourselves about the limitations of wind and so, or like weather powered energy sources. And, you know, all credible models include baseload energy sources from hydro, geothermal, and nuclear energy. And, you know, as someone who was formerly anti-nuclear working in the solar industry, I had to learn the hard way that grid power is necessary. And so I encourage, you know, the community to continue to look into what it takes to really power the whole grid 24 hours a day. And... Um, the notion, you know, while it would be nice if we could all have microgrids everywhere, it's a nice idea. Um, you know, the physics of the matter demands a macro grid for the foreseeable future. And until battery technologies become far, far better than what we have and, and less impact on the environment, you know, we're going to rely on a shared energy grid. So we need to look to clean that up together. And I think nuclear energy is one of those solutions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Seeing no other members of the public with their hands raised. Um, Member Sousa, did you have a comment that you'd like to make? Well, yes, I mean, actually, the, the comments are really good. Um, I, I learned a lot from them. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I actually um, very confused about the changes between uh, NEM2 and NEM3. I was kind of hoping because NEM2 kind of was widely uh, panned or uh, rejected, uh, that NEM3 would look better. <laughs> And I kind of had some hopes on that. So you can clarify that, Mr. Juarez. And um, the other thing is, is now electrification is something that we talk about, uh, but it, it, it's specific to individual people, individual buildings. And, and if they electrify, they actually add, obviously they add uh, electric heating, electric water heating, uh, and, and, you know, the, the gas use goes down. So it, it basically supplants the gas. So essentially what we're looking at is a situation where the, the home, w which had a baseline or a, uh, was using half gas, half electricity, uh, now is using full electricity. Um, that has to shift and we have to think about uh, you know, with the, the, the additional 
additional uh, drain on the, on the grid, the electrical grid, and how to uh, compensate people who are making the move for electrification. So I, I, you did mention that in your, in your uh, pre presentation, and I didn't quite understand. It was kind of, you mentioned it very quickly. If you can go back to that at some point in time, I'd really appreciate that. And that's it, thank you. Um, thank you, Member Lutz. Yeah, I had a, several other questions, but um, sort of a fundamental one was, does EVCE have to follow CPUC regulations on them? I mean, we buy our electricity, we sell it to our customers, we can set our own rates. Do we have to follow the NEM guidance or can EVCE make up its own and do what it wants? And then that's sort of a yes, no question. But the, then I have several other questions. Um, there was a, in your, dis, your presentation, it was at, talked about allocating costs and benefits. And I wanted to ask about whose costs and whose benefits um, distributed solar means you don't have to add as much transmission. So that's a benefit to EVCE, but it's a cost to PG&E because, or whoever's building the transmission lines. So it seemed, I haven't dug into it, but it's not clear who the costs and benefits are. And um, another thing I'd like to, see from EBC's perspective, what is, is the resilient home program, how do, how does that compare or relate to, to NEM, NEM 2 or NEM 3? Is, is that, would the, the resilient home have to be under NEM 3 or could it be done However, you know, whatever EBC works best for EBC. And um, so those are the sorts of questions I had and would like to hear more about it. And one other final one is if EBC owned the distributed generation and, and control uh, generation and storage, what are the costs there compared to the costs of the large remote solar when you account and you know the difference you know if EBCE paid its avoided cost for long distance solar and storage to the local distributed solar and storage, what would the, that be relative to the proposed NEMS cost? So those are the sort of questions I have, and I haven't dug into them enough, but I was hoping there might be quick answers. Actually, if you are able to answer the, the points that have been brought up both by the well, from the last two members, it would be really helpful. Sure, plenty of great questions. So to your, to your question of whether or not EBCE would be required to follow uh, the new NEM proposal if it were adopted by the CPUC. Um, so we are not required to follow whatever the CPUC adopts. That being said, my understanding is that we typically mirror to a large extent the uh, net energy metering policies that they do adopt. So um, no decisions have been made at this point, especially considering that the sort of CPUC's NEM policy has not been finalized. Um, to your question about resilient homes, uh, the resilient homes program, those, those customers would, be, would go into sort of whatever EBCE's net energy metering policy is. If it is updated, those customers um, will fall into that new net metering program or policy. Um, 
you ask very good questions about benefits and costs and sort of uh, the relative benefits of owning distribute our own sort of distributed resources. I'm not sure if that's something I can speak to um, off the top of my head or, or give you sort of a co comprehensive enough answer. Um, and I apologize, I, I can't quite remember what the questions were from the previous individual. There was a question, this is Todd Edmister, I'm the, I'm the um, Director of Public Policy here at ABC, and uh, I, will, I will jump in on the ELEC question because I, I was involved in the development of that rate in pg es prior general rate case. And uh, it's essentially being, the purpose of it is essentially being expanded here. Uh, as the member previously indicated, it, it, it was originally set up as an electrification tariff. And the idea was that if customer installed some technology that involved fuel switching, so, so shifted from gas to electric for say, heat and ventilation and air conditioning or a gas stove or, or such, um, their electricity consumption would go up. And under traditional tariffs, they would take a really big hit for their bill, their electric bill, because they would be using more than the baseline consumption or even more above baseline than they were using. And that would get, uh, would get tagged at the essentially the, the higher or highest available rate. And that's a problem. That's a real discourage a real, a real discouraging thing for somebody who wants to electrify. And so the, the ELEC tariff was, was designed to avoid that problem um, and essentially encourage the electrification of, of homes. Um, but some bright soul at the PUC apparently in, in the course of revising the, P, the, the, the proposed decision from last year uh, to the proposed decision we have now thought, hey, that could be adapted to address some of the issues around solar as well. Um, and so now, in, in addition to picking up customers, uh, Greg's member says, I think he was the one who was talking about this. So in addition to picking up customers who are fuel switching and getting rid of a gas appliance in favor of electric appliance, it would now be used by the, the NEM customers, the solar rooftop customers. So that's the, that seems to be the concept here it is a repurposing or an expansion of what ELEC uh, has historically been about. And as somebody else noted earlier, it does have a fixed charge associated with it, which addresses the, I think the biggest issue from a legal perspective that the PUC was having with this decision, which was that it was gonna impose a fixed charge just on solar. Um, you know, this way they move them into a, into a bucket that has a fixed charge, but isn't applicable to a larger universe of customers, not targeting solar in particular. So that's the history there. I, I hope that addresses your, your question, Member Susan. Yeah, yes, it does. Um, I, I'm actually electrifying um, at my house. I have plenty of solar. Um, you know, I, I, I do, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly, I, I try to envision with all of these changes to everything, to the technology for your, for electrifying your house, to battery technology, to potential other kinds of renewable powers, what would a really good grid look like? And 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 this is something I would really love to get involved with and try and figure out, brainstorm, a look at technologies to see how the future uh, can can fit into our current kind of you know 1920s grid right so you know, wherever whenever the grid was originally built so uh, we definitely need to be thinking about these things net metering has its faults for sure uh, but uh, equity is definitely probably one of those things that I think I think the problem is is that People look at it like net net metering was supposed to encourage people to put solar on. We have a big problem with climate change. Everybody should just go full bore towards that. And and so we're looking at why are we going backwards on that? So anyway, that's just my comments. Thank you so much, uh, Todd, for for answering my questions. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I mean, this was you know the, the NEM the NEM tariff was the subject of extension extensive discussions over the course of a year. Uh, in the GRC, it is interesting to see it getting adapted 
Uh, now, I mean, this was not what it was originally intended for, but um, conceptually, it, it certainly has its its appeal. So that's where we are at. Did I, does that pick up, uh, Member Lutz and and Susie, your questions? I think we covered them. I'd like to offer uh, one clarification to a previous statement I made about um, sort of us not being required to follow CPUC um, guidelines around them. Um, when it comes to transmission and distribution rates, which we are are not in control of as a CCA, in those in those cases, we will um, sort of need to follow the the NIM 3.0 policy. Yeah, that's worth bringing up and amplifying on a little. We we control the gen side. PG&E's bill basically has three components. It has a non-bypassable charge component, has a wires component, transmission distribution, has a gen component. NEM doesn't really map neatly onto that. It's, it's kind of a holdover from, from the, the old paradigm where those things were neatly compartmentalized, but that's what the bills have. And under under the, the new NEM, you're, you're, you're still gonna have a non-bypassable charge over which we have no control. Um, that exemption that, that Michael referenced earlier, that's gonna go away, it's gonna go away, right? Regardless of what we wanna do, there will be non-bypassable charges on NEM customer bills now. Not something we can affect, except through comments and so forth. Um, likewise with the wires charges, the fixed charge is supposed to be calibrated to reflect the wires charges on the theory that they're essentially a fixed charge. They don't vary with with usage. Once you're, once you're plugged in, it costs whatever it costs to plug in and supply your load, whether you're only using it for one hour of the day or 24, um, the wires are cost what they cost. That's the argument. And again, we, we at EBC have no impact over that portion of the bill. The only piece that we and control is the is the gen piece. So I think that's worth amplifying on. Even if we do want to tweak our rates, um, we're not going to directly impact non-bypassables or, or wires charges, which is what the fixed charge is going to be. So for just to really simplify that, there are fixed charges. They're not something that we would be able to avoid if this passes. Um, and it, so just first, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, that, can we get that slide updated for the... Yeah, I mean, the, the things that we can play with in, in NEMLAND are basically how you calculate the surplus compensation right. and how you set the surplus compensation rate. Those are those are the, the levers that we can, that we can pull. And okay, so we, if we, we don't... We tweak those a little, but um, yeah. If we don't have to follow what the CPU says on NIM policy, except in the case of transmission and distribution, which are actually pretty substantial, that we have to follow them, um, we well, transmission's FERC actually. Even the PC is stuck with what FERC does. But yeah, um, right. Uh, we but we do have a clear NIM policy in our local development business plan um, that is reflective of our agency's values. And um, there was a lot of staff time and community input into the creation of that policy. Do you have an idea of how this is impacting our customers um, and the plans? I know that we'd kind of stalled out on moving forward with our, um, our originally outlined NEM policy. Um, like we did a little bit, but then just haven't, move forward with some of the other adders for um, the values that the that had been outlined by the board. Um, do, you, do you know how this is gonna interact with that and our ability to do things on that front? Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, what it sounds like what you're talking about would be on the gen rate side of the, of the equation. And I, and I know that, and this is probably a better question for Annie, I can throw her under the bus because she's not here. Um, but the, the 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 rates that we have set for NEM on the gen side do in fact vary from from what PGE does. Uh, we do a monthly, I believe we do a monthly calculation for net surplus calculation for net surplus calculation, whereas PGE does an annual true up. Um, so we have we have made some changes, uh, but I don't I don't know quite how those play out in the, in the individual customer context. And then it's really nice to see you again, Tad. It's great. Um, uh, one other qu clarification from Michael, um, the slide um, switches between uh, compensation terms of credit and payment. Um, and a credit is 
it's just a credit. It's not like they have to mail you a check. They just like deduct that part. It doesn't actually cost them anything. Um, a payment to me sounds like they mail you a check. Um, are you talking about um, the switch from 2.0 to 3.0 as uh, an additional credit or is it um, a payment? And if, um, I know in some areas there's a restriction on how much rooftop solar you can put on top of your um, your home or whatever. Um, and uh, like, does that mean that you could actually do a whole bunch and actually be contributing a lot of solar to the grid or something along those lines, or is there still that uh, capacity cap? Yeah, so that's a very good question, worth clarification. Um, and I'll be sure to sort of update the slides so that there's consistency in the use of those two terms. Um, it is, it's still a credit. Um, so when, if, if you sort of generate more than you are consuming in the course of a, a, a day, a month, et cetera, um, those will count as, as credits initially. Um, you won't be mailed a check for each individual sort of kilowatt hour that you send back to the grid. Um, if, if my understanding of, the, of, of NEM is correct, the only case in which you would be paid is at the end of the true up period, which um, as Todd was mentioning for pg and &E customers is annual, for uh, EBCE customers has been monthly. If you still generate more than you use over that true up period, I believe at that point you are issued a payment. Um, Todd, is that your understanding as well? I, I just don't remember. I would have to punt that to Andy. JP is raising his hand, maybe you know if Andy, JP. Yeah, we actually updated the NEM policy so that customers can choose between monthly or annual true up. Um, so people can decide uh, what they want to do, if they want to bank over the course of the year or if they want to get um, monthly. So those, that was one update that we made, it's the last update that we made. That's good to know, but large, at large sort of credit is the correct term there. Yeah, yeah I, I think that payment is, um, is something that uh, utilities are using and credit is something that is more accurate to reflect what's going there. So it'd be great if we could um, kind of aggressively use that yeah. language. Um, yeah, you only get a payment if it's above 100 bucks. To, uh, to jump in, uh, Adrian, if you could promote her, she is on as number 9681, she may just know. Here we go. All right, Annie, you're up. Uh, you're still muted though. And thank you for being here, but you uh, you have to unmute from your site. I just responded to her uh, text as well, so. Great. JP, is your hand still up or? Uh, while we wait for Annie to come, uh, just to be clear, if if the, the end of the, say, annual trip period, if your credit is larger than $100, then a customer gets a check. If it's less than $100, they get a bill credit. Um, to be clear, both of those are payments. They just come in different formats um, for the energy, you know, for the value of the energy that has been generated. Um, so that just, that's according to our NEM policy. Great, thank you. Um, hey, Adrian, is it possible to unmute Annie? She said <clears throat> She shows us muted on my. I do not have the ability to. I am trying to unmute Annie, but I'm unable to. Yay. Ah. Hey, folks. I think I, I, I got it figured out. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Thank you, Todd and Adrian, for being my proxy for a moment, and, and JP as well. So I just wanted to speak quickly to the NEM policy. Um, so first to the, the local business um, development plan, you know, we have since the time that we launched our NIM policy had additional adders for low income uh, customers in the uh, export credit. Um, we did in the, I'd say the last year, 
a survey of our NIM customers and found that many of them were not even aware of our greater benefits that were offered through our NIM policy. We did make adjustments based on that, but we continue to offer the same, if not better, uh, than what customers would get if they were a PG&E customer. And to JP's point, um, we do currently um, basically bill a customer on a monthly basis if they are a NEM or solar customer. If they have used more than they generated, we actually bill them in that month. Um, but And then at the end of the year, we do a true up. And if they have enough credits, if they're over $100, we send them a check. If it's under $100, it just becomes a bill credit, so they don't lose anything. They just don't get a physical check. Uh, they just get it applied to, to future bills. Um, we did have the board approve, instead of that monthly sort of reconciliation or true up or billing, uh, a customer could select to do an annual true up, similar to what is the current experience with PG&E. We have speculated that it was more beneficial to have incremental payments rather than one, for some people, fairly massive bill at the end of the year. If you have a, a small solar system and, and maybe you've added an EV or you have other high electricity draw, you could get a fairly substantial bill at the end of the year. So we thought it was beneficial, but turns out people actually could potentially prefer that. And so we're making it a choice. The default will be monthly, but customers actually just last week began receiving email notifications. They will also get paper notifications, letting them know about the option to switch to annual. So I wanted to just speak up in particular to note that for those listening or who listen to the recording, this is not yet something that we support. It is something we are in the process of supporting. Um, these tend to be our most attentive customers and they are already calling our call center requesting for this annual trip. There is a webinar that is coming up in January um, that we have invited those customers to attend. But to be clear, it is not about NEM 3.0. It is about the annual true up option that we are now offering to customers. So I just wanted to, to make that clear and sort of offer a reminder of this distinction between the annual true up that we are in the process of implementing versus NEM 3.0, which is a separate policy decision. And to um, Michael and Todd's point, you know, our analysis of NEM 3.0 as it currently stands is that, you know, there is somewhat limited ability for EDCE to dampen the impact of this, given that we only control the generation side. It is extremely com uh, complex, especially given some of the sort of rate referencing um, essentially being like you have to look at what is the cost of power on the market at any particular time. So it will be complex for us to implement on our side, but the potential customer confusion of having certain signals from PG&E versus signals from us um, is also something that we're taking into account, but nothing has been set yet. And any implementation plan, any changes to our policy would be going to our board before implemented, um, going to the board for review, feedback, and then ultimate approval. That was really helpful, Annie. Um, thank you, all of y'all. Um, it, it does sound like this policy would be really bad for our customers. Like it sounds like there would be non-bypassable charges that would get passed on to everybody. Um, have we taken a clear uh, opposition to this? To non-bypassable charges? No. No, that was not part of the, the scope that the board approved way back when, when they were reviewing our position on this response to the first meeting. Um, is it part of a recommendation that is coming from staff that we do take a look at opposing that? Uh, no. And I should note the comments have already been filed as, as Michael summarized them. Uh, can I ask why? Uh, we were going based on the prior board guidance from roughly this time last year. As far as why they didn't, I don't know that dated my involvement in 3.0. 
um, did they vote against it? I I don't know. Okay, it's I'll try and look as well as now. That has not changed. All right, I'll try and take a look at that. Um, now, when's the deadline for comments? Well, they've been filed. They were filed last week. Yes, our, our comments have been made, but when is the deadline for all comment? Uh, everybody's were due at the same time. Oh, everyone's were due at the same time. Okay, so comment over. Right. I mean, remember, um, that we're just one amongst many interveners in all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't we don't have any special status to PC as regards comments on this proposed decision. Okay. Um, Member Lips. Yeah, um, I was looking at my bill today, and over half the, more than half my electricity bill are these non-bypassable charges. They are completely separate from generation, and it seems like that's the trend that's going to be continuing. So the, that leads me to think that EBCE has less and less room to offer any financial benefits to our customers. And I don't know what EBCE should do about it, but you know, if we're selling our electricity as cleaner and, and cheaper, but oh, by the way, your electricity bill is 80% not about electricity use, then cheaper doesn't mean much anymore. And I just wanted to, to bring that up as a concern. That seems really legitimate. Um, all right, I have a memory of something, I don't know what it is. I guess, um, All right, thank you for this. Um, <coughs> um, I there are there still like for the public and for us, are there still um is there still opportunity for um advocacy in any area? Like does it have to go to the governor now or does it like what's the next process in, in decision making? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and field that. So the next action by the commission will be to vote on the decision. Um, there will probably be a, what's called a REV1, a revised proposed decision that comes out uh, between now and Thursday, which is when they will vote on it. There may be a hold on it after that comes out uh, based on whatever input commission decides it's willing to take from, from the comments that it has received. Uh, in which case the, the vote would roll over to the next business meeting, which would be in January. Um, so we'll see. But conceivably, there's a commission vote on Thursday, their regular, regularly scheduled business meeting. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. That was a much more robust topic than I expected it to be. From the uh, information that was given to me, I'm I'm glad we had the amount of time for it that we did. I feel like um, there must be still some point to advocacy. I would like us to uh, at some point take a look at uh, non-bypassable charges and uh, perhaps being proactive about advocating for our customers on that, especially when it would um, negatively impact so many of them. Um, Okay, so that brings us to the end. I, I don't see anybody else with their hand raised. Um, I do, actually, there is one more member of the public with their hand raised. Um, it's 8.07, are y'all okay with hearing one more public comment and then um, doing announcements and closing the meeting? Is there any, if you have opposition, if you are a member of the CAC and you have opposition, to um, staying on for one more comment, um, please use the raise hand function to signal that now. 
All right, y'all are awesome. Um, okay, and and if if folks have to jump off, um, I, I do understand. Um, I need Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, uh, Member Swaminathan, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. All right, um, Jessica Tovar uh, will do um, two minutes, and um, and then we will we will close. You're recognized for two minutes, Jessica Tovar. Listen, I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I failed to share that um, I did forward to the clerk a little while ago. Uh, the local clean energy alliances asks for actions um, against the current net energy metering proposal through the CPUC. So um, please check your email. Please forward that to all the CAC members. Um, but we are asking folks to sign on to our petition which goes to the governor and the California Public Utilities Commissioners, who are the deciders this Thursday on the fate of net energy metering in the state of California. We are asking uh, folks to call the governor and his number is 916-445-2841, 916-445-2841. Um, and then Thursday at 11 a.m. is the CPUC meeting. Um, if folks can call in and speak there, um, you can check out our website, localcleanenergy.org. Thank you so much. That was quick. We do appreciate it. All right. Um, seeing no further comments, we will move now to agenda item uh, seven, CAC member and staff announcements, including requests to place items on future CAC agendas. Um, again. We can't say next meeting, but if you would like to see something discussed um, that has not been previously raised, we really do keep a list. Um, let us know now. Uh, Member Hernandez. Uh, and you know, Chair, I think it's important to review that letter uh, sent by Jessica Tavar and the Clean Energy Alliance to understand what it is, has occurred and better understanding for this body to understand what is was not working out well, you know, finding the truth, understanding how to work with staff to ensure they are respectful, not that they're not, but making sure um, that we can work together with the community, its leaders, the representatives, CAC staff, and the board to bring clean and renewable energy, more of it, with good paying jobs in our community. Overall, I think it's important to have this identified and researched or investigated further by independent third party to do the research and claims understood and validated or, or you know, finding what occurred and you know, ways to go better. Jessica, when there is anything of concern in any bottle body, there is also you know, the opportunity to do a third party investigation or refer it to the grand jury it depends really on the board direction, what the board direction with their uh, the agency's attorney can do or its CEO, but he may be conflicted. And that's why you'd maybe look into an independent third party to investigate these claims and actions and and talk with the parties who maybe have this information. So I think that's what I would suggest. I think it's an urgent matter and should be looked at and brought back with some attention the new year and of course we can vote on it but this is just my thoughts opinions and we can move from there Thank we don't you, actually we don't actually have to vote on that um uh but i'll be connecting with you after this meeting vice chair and um and as i said i'll be following up uh but you'll be looped into that too and um taking a look at what is in the public rec records request act and all that so thank you yeah Pleasure, thank you. Um, all right, I do not see further hands. Uh, everyone, um, this is uh, 
Wednesday's meeting is the last meeting that many of our board members um, will be attending because they're either turned out or got elected to a different body or um, did not run for re-election. Um, and so if you want to come and give your respects on Wednesday, um, that meeting starts at 6 p.m., not 5 p.m. Is that correct, Adrian? Yep. Um, and uh, is still available online. Um, the holiday season is hard for a lot of folks. Um, it's doubly hard in a time when there is so many different kinds of illnesses running around and really, really impacting a lot of folks these days. So um, please stay safe and be kind to each other. Um, enjoy um, your holidays and uh, we will see you in the new, in the new year. Um, our next meeting is January 17th of 2023. I cannot believe how fast that year went. Um, and I am deeply, deeply grateful to every one of you for um, being present and engaged and prepared for these meetings and really helping us um, lead the kind of energy transition that we are um, experiencing in, in California and that is so desperately needed for our planet. So thank each of you. And uh, we will see you next year. This meeting is adjourned. Good night. Feel better, Anne. <laughs> Thanks. Happy holidays and feel better. This is Cynthia. Thank you. Ho, ho, ho. And happy holidays, Adrian, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Okay.